Okay, so I'm recording. I'm here with Russell and Arellis of the Rare Genomics Institute. And the goal here for Open Source Ecology is to learn about recruiting human resources tasks from an organization that's doing really well at it. Uh, the Rare Genomics Institute, they have a full HR team and, and good success in terms of leveraging a, a large number of volunteer contributions. And that is, uh, as, as a volunteer organization, uh, they're very successful in doing what they do. So for OSC's, OSC's goal of doing the open source technology development, the goal is the same. How do we get an abundant measure of subject matter experts and other professionals to contribute to the project, formalize that to make it, uh, to make our effort uh, much more powerful. The ultimate role model for what we would want to do, just for your reference, Russell and or else, um, probably have heard of um, Linux as the most uh, as the largest so software project in the world that gathers like a billion dollars of, of software contributions per year and why don't we do the same for open source hardware that means generating open source blueprints for all the stuff that civilization uses as a basically a public library of appropriate technology for modern day appropriate technology that's open source um, so that's kind of like one of our heroes, uh, the Linux movement, which has a huge, huge number of volunteers collaborating. But what's needed to get people aligned, keep people on board, and all of that, we'd like to discuss that. So, so I got a number, a great, a great deal of the the supporting documents. So maybe, what would you suggest? Um, how do we proceed with it, with this? Because I'd like to basically learn what you guys do, like what your process is, step by step, and then see how we adapt all of that to to the work of open source ecology. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how about one of the things that I have are your questions. Yeah. And um, and how about if we kind of go through those and okay. um, answer answer them. And Arellis, uh, Arellis is a subject matter expert. So and, and she's been uh, with the organization uh, long enough to really be able to talk about the specific details of, of I would say of all of our processes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What's especially important with that are the, uh, the tools and resources we use and how we engage in it. Um, and then, uh, uh, Arellis, why don't you introduce yourself and with your title and mm -hmm. what you do with your community? Excellent. Um, what you give me your title and what you do with the, within uh, the organization. Okay, I'm currently the director of uh, volunteer management. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I focus on the, initially the onboarding of the organization, of the new candidates coming into the organization. Um, I'm also focused on um, volunteer retention at this point mm -hmm. and uh, keeping track of performance evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, trying to address issues that may come up um, with either uh, employee relations or um, just keeping track of how the volunteers feel regarding their work and your organization. Obviously, with an eye towards mm -hmm. trying to keep the best talent in your organization and avoid having, um, you know, our best volunteers in your organization. Yeah. So to begin with, what's what's how many volunteers do you guys have? Like, just for reference, what's the size of your organization right now? Each contributing how much how much time per week is there a regular like I, I heard the figure of four hours per week is that your standard for the minimum for a volunteer is that uh, Russell is does it start with ten with or is it or is ten the average total? Ten's the average. We 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 uh we request a five hour minimum from all of our volunteers per week, but based on the team uh -huh. that they're on and the work that they're doing, they're, we're, we're typically around ten hours a week. Wow. And that that includes uh, meeting times. Meeting times, okay. Yeah, I get the sense, I get the sense that the, the average is that um, our volunteers help 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 with it's about ten hours per week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and these are we're talking about professionals who do this completely in a voluntary way. Do you also have some people that 
do this as part of I don't know volunteer service requirements for different organizations or tell me more about your pro the profile of your volunteer uh, uh, 90 right 90 percent of our volunteers are doing it um, simply because they enjoy the work and they like the organization mm -hmm. we have we've had a couple of folks work with us who were connected to specific grants mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so they were some of their work is funded through a grant and then we've had um, two people who mm -hmm. were doing um, community service and chose us as a community service organization okay. um, because of their, their background and skill set and because they like the organization. So uh, I, almost all of our volunteers are doing it uh, on, their own, um, on their own time. Okay. As far as the structure, so, so for us, I mean, we've got, um, we have, you can say, two full-time people on a, on a core staff rest as volunteers and other and contractors for specific to various projects what is your level of staffing for the organization itself just to give a perspective on how much um, infrastructure is needed like what resources are needed for an effective volunteer program so do you have you have paid staff at the core in the HR department no no we have no paid staff we, 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 uh, we have uh, at the core of our HR all of us are volunteers so we have no paid Okay. Is there any anyone within the organization, like the ED or whoever, that gets paid? Or uh, the the executive director was connected. He was one of the people connected to a grant. Okay. Um, but when that grant um, ended, he still he is still participating and serving in that capacity. Okay. And we, we had our, our director of um, uh, of one special project who was also um, a paid staff member but she was paid through a grant as well so okay. those are those are the only two people who were paid jimmy jimmy is not paid okay and, and neither neither are our board members so, okay uh, at some point we may move to from a uh, non-profit um all volunteer to a non-profit w2 but we're not at that um we're not at that phase yet wow so so right now you're 100 percent volunteer driven Okay. Uh, Jimmy mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, for perspective. Um, Jimmy mentioned something like uh, there was a budget associated with the organization. What does the budget go for? That's for for your work? The, the budgets are set up for a couple of things. Um, um, we, so, one of the things that we do is we help individuals raise funds so that they can get genomic or genomic testing. So, part of the, um, part of the funds go to that. Part of the funds go to um, buying uh, necessary resources like programs. For example, we, we are we put in a budget, submitted a budget for uh, HRIS, our human resource information system, so that we can um, uh, have some easier ways to uh, collect data, store data. But mm -hmm. the teams that really are using the budget are our finance team, which needs to buy software so that they can a new budget, our um, uh, patient advocacy and policy team, and some of our IT team so that they can, they can purchase resources so that they can continue to build the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's specifically connected to uh, a team that has um, specific needs. So each, each uh, uh, team can submit um, funding requests and uh, they'll look at um, providing those funds. So, okay. Sometimes we also um, uh, uh, travel or go to conferences, and some of the some of the funds are used to support that as well. Uh huh. So, but on the for example, IT team or all the, these teams that you mentioned, the people don't have a, any staff salary or anything like that, or any. No. Mm -hmm. So it's still whatever it is. It's hard costs. Whatever your infrastructure you have, like like paying for bandwidth or whatever. And the, the interesting, the other the other piece about that is, um, mm -hmm. um, we also receive donations from corporations for like licenses for three sixty five or for other software tools, and the and we so those are kind of in kind donations that we yeah. are able to use within the organization. So that that works out really well as well. Right. Right. Uh, describe for the audience just briefly the core of the work of Rare Genomics Institute. 
the what what does most of the work like for example for a volunteer uh, what is the typical work uh, work assignment or, or the work that you do well um, let me start off by saying two forms we have um, 16 well 13 different teams that have um, very detailed functions within the organization um, and I, I can send you mm -hmm. those so I won't take your time but that, yeah we have a we have scientific affairs or patient advocacy and policy we have a finance team a mm -hmm. science team um, a human resource team an IT team all of these teams um, a director of our, our international sites all of these these uh, teams have staff members mm -hmm. who serve a function to support the mission vision and values of the organization mm -hmm. so our, uh, our 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 patient advocacy and policy team those are scientists and doctors who actually work with um, um, uh, patients and families to help mm -hmm. them find resources to get the genomic or genomic testing done. And then our um, uh, Science 2.0 team has a team of scientists who actually review the data. So okay. we, have, we have counselors, we have um, doctors and scientists who will um, meet with families who help them through the process of, of um, understanding their uh, rare disease to give them um, guidance on resources that they can engage in to try to uh, help them find hope. Mm -hmm. And then or there are teams that walk those individuals through the process of getting a genetic or genomic testing. And they also um, review the data. So um, many okay. families have doctors that they see often, but they just don't understand the data. So yeah. we will actually help them review it. But we so but if you have our, our foundation, the branch team, those folks are actually going out and, and uh, looking for resources to support that piece. Our and our IT department is looking for ways that they can build our website and mm -hmm. develop apps so that families and, and members of the community have a way to engage with us that is realistic and engaging. So every team has a specific focus and mission and they fully engage in that with their staff. Okay, great. Um, so maybe next we can go into, sorry, you mentioned questions that, uh, do you have a list of questions from us that? I do, I do. Okay. And I, like, first, what is your protocol for HR in detail? <laughs> uh, 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 I, I'll, I'll give you some initial information. So the HR um, department has a mission to support the success of the organization. And we do that through our um, uh, recruitment, uh, volunteer engagement, and kind of a, a, not just our onboarding process, but our management. What, what's been really important for us as a team is to change our hiring practices so that we find people who have a really excellent skill set mm -hmm. in, the, in the needed field, but also who has a passion. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's been important for us in the relative Tell me if you have any additional thoughts on this. It's important that we find people who have um, um, knowledge of the skills required to do the work. So, for example, we have um, uh, a number of geneticists on the team, but those geneticists have to understand the human genome. So there are many others who, who are plants or biologists or who, are, um, uh, who work with mice, but that, that, that isn't necessarily effective for us in the human genome. So find known scientists and, and physicians and others, and then we look for their passions and we bring them in. And we do that for every team. So for the HR team, Arus is really skilled in her in her work and in her background, mm -hmm. and then she brings her passion for what we do into that, so that her professional um, experience is directly connected to the work that she does. And and that that's that's one of the ways that we've changed things in the past two years, so that. Um, we, we don't just hire volunteers because they're interested. We mm -hmm. hire volunteers because they have a skill set and a passion and can do that work. And then that, that also adds an extra component to them where it allows them to um, uh, update or support their resume because they are fully engaged and continue to do the work that they are trained to do. Mm -hmm. So th that's been great. Okay. So as you as you develop your website or, or, or if you're looking for architects or engineers, those are people that you want to uh, target 
um, in addition to those folks who said, and I have a passion for giving back to the community, and I have an interest in um, uh, uh, volunteer work. work. Okay. Not just people who want to do something. They have to want to do what, what your organization needs. Because that's how we've reduced our turnover. Uh huh. And should should I um should we go through all the questions or should I ask questions right now regarding that? Uh, you can ask whatever questions you yeah. want. Yeah. Right. So I mean, this is like this is um gets into art in a sense that how do you right. find somebody who's actually passionate and how do you assess that? So what are the tools that you're using to assess the mission fit here and? that this person is authentically interested like how do you measure their alignment i guess is that the good question to ask i mean the alignment i mean that the cultural alignment is a critical feature that's i mean people may be interested but they might not have the skill set or the yeah. true interest and how do you how do you get underneath what they're saying to to gauge that that's a great question and uh, i'll start and then i'll let let the relatives continue mm -hmm. um, we have a multi-stage process. So we post the positions in Volunteer Match and uh, LinkedIn and other sites, um, Genome Web and other places where we know that, that the people who have the skills will be looking. Um, they fill out a, 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 a pretty detailed questionnaire uh, through Volunteer mm -hmm. Match and other, and other areas. I think I sent you that. Yes. Kind of the questionnaire. They answer those questions, they submit um, their position, and then we review them. We review them based on the, the specific needs of the uh, department. And if they meet the needs, then we look at what the department wants. So the needs are one thing. I need somebody with skill as a you know, UI designer, whatever it may be. We get all those. We look at the kind of the, the, the time frame, how long they've been doing the work, and we look at that to engage their um, interest, whether they just graduated um, and are looking for something and are really passionate, or they've been doing it for a long time and are looking to get back. Those are the answers that we that we look at. Okay. And then we an initial uh, HR does the initial um, um, kind of skills interview. Well, well, we actually HR does the initial fit interview. We start off with fit, and then we have them work with the specific team leads, and they talk about the specific tasks of that team. So we do minimally two interviews. Uh, well, well, uh, two uh, phone interviews talking about of the needs of the team, their interests, their background, their wants and desires, and then the team looks at their skill set. Do you, do you have anything to add to that, Aronis? I'm sorry, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? I, why are you, I muted you because there was noise, but how do we unmute you? I, I click on that mute. It it has the pull down for mute, but it doesn't have a pull down for unmute. <laughs> uh, if you can you just click on it again? That's what I'm doing on my uh, my thing. If I click on a muted thing, it's not going away. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How, how did you do that? Huh? How did you unmute yourself? Yeah. Well. I just clicked again. Just mentioned. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I think, guys, guys, please. I think that. Um, well, let me just get back on here. Okay. I think it's very important that in, is that initially we make it clear that um, even though you're volunteering for the organization. We do need, we need to see that you really are committed to working mm -hmm. with the organization. You really do have time to volunteer to the organization. And I think it also needs to come from your heart. Yes, you, need, you do need to have the skills that are requested, but it's not like, oh, you're, you're a volunteer today and you're gone tomorrow. We need someone who, who really, um, like I mentioned, from the heart, wishes to contribute to the cause and um, understand that they really need to come really, really, really being able to do the work. 
I mean, they may not look at it. It's a real job, regardless of whether you're getting paid or not. Yes, absolutely. It's a real job, and they're being um, they're being evaluated as if it was a real job. And yes. I think some people may come in not really understanding what they're signing up for. Right. And that is why we, um, during the application process, there's a series of questions that ask, that try to identify how this person feels now giving the hearing. Um, we try to focus on well, how many hours are you able to volunteer to show them that you're not just going to turn on your computer for five minutes and you've done your job. Right. Um, and I think that's a way of weeding out anyone who um, who didn't put initially what it would take needs to be established is that we're bringing in um, staff who understand that they really need to be committed to the work and to the cause. Okay. In the documents that Russell you sent do any of those documents describe how that is done? So what is this? So this sounds like soft skills to get that determination, or do you have a very formal process to determine that? Well, um, we, we, there's a couple of questions that we always ask, and, and, the, the, and there, um, there are three questions, but they're also statements. So um, we let in, we let all volunteers know that we have a minimum requirement of five hours per week. Okay, so five uh -huh. hours. Uh, the second is that uh, we, we ensure that they know that we have a, a 90 day, we ask all our volunteers to stay with us for 90 days. Um, and that 90 day period is a period mm -hmm. where they have um, the responsibilities of past uh, completion as a volunteer. Uh -huh. At the end of 90 days, there is a, a review. And that review is for them um, if it's a good fit and for us to review them and their work. And that 90-day period allows them to participate in uh, uh, at least three staff meetings based on how many meetings the, the team has in okay. a month or whatever um, to, to gain a greater understanding of the organization as a whole, not just their team. And then at the end of 90 days, we let them know if there is a specific position that they have applied for, meaning or if there's a title, um, uh, like a director position or anything, uh, or a management position, that then that title is provided, and they get uh, they, that's when they uh, they get an, an email, uh, rare genomics email. They potentially get a rare genomics uh, ring central phone line and all that. They get all the information once they um, uh, start. But after that, after that 90 day period, after we do a review, that's when we make the decision about whether it's working for us and whether it's working for them. And then they also huh. after that 90 days have an opportunity to. Um, move to different teams if the other teams have a need for their skills. And then the other thing that we're able to, that we really talk about is the fact that we're a virtual um, uh, community, that there are there are very specific needs in terms of communication effectiveness that, that, that we need. Um, email is uh, important, but sometimes email is um, uh, dispassionate, and there can be communication errors in email. Uh -huh. You know, people pick up tones that, that weren't meant or other things. Yep. So we talk with them about that during the interview. And we talk about their skills with working with virtual communities okay. and how they can participate in that and what it means. So so literally, we will have someone who is um, one day in New York, um, two days later they're in San Francisco, and after that they're in Cairo. And those, and, but their meeting structure on you know, Eastern Standard Time. So even though folks are traveling around the world and doing their regular work, we still ask them for commitment to participate uh, with the organization. And for many, that is really a draw, that they don't have to show up at a physical location. Uh -huh. but we, we talk about those three things, and then we and then look, we, we, we talk about what the organization is about, and that we, uh, and that we truly respect the volunteer and we respect their time and we ask them to do that same thing with others to respect the, the volunteers that they work with to respect their time and come to the organization fully engaged so Arellis has a you know, she's got a full-time job so mm -hmm. when she takes time off to, to do, do work with us or when she gets home from 
work, and she has a meeting. And, and around mm-hmm. is extra special because not only does she have um, uh, a management role within human resources, but she is a, 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 a project manager. And she's mm-hmm. on, a, on a whole other team where she works with all other team members who are project managers. So each, each team has at least one project manager who, who is able to see the big picture and how all of the organizational pieces should connect. It's really, I, mm-hmm. I would say that's a critical function within the organization because other teams really just focus on their own specific task completion, but the PM who is with that team should be able to take a step back, look at the work that they're doing on their team and see how it connects with other teams and how it supports the organization. And so that that's a critical role and a critical function. And um, so we talk about all that with the teams or, or with the individuals during the interview. This is the first two interviews after the after the detailed um, detailed uh, interview form. That's where yes. that happens? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Arellis, how long are your interviews typically when you do your, when you do your first? 30 minutes. So, and, and, and Marcia, one of the things that we have people say every now and then mm-hmm. is, wow, you, you all are really serious. You're treating this as if it was a real job. And we say, yeah, we are. And so at times we've had people say, um, literally, well, do you know who I am? You know, I'm the, uh, I'm the, the, the and this is, a make up a name, I'm the chief um, IT director for Cisco. So I shouldn't have to interview. You should just look at my resume and know that I'm good. Mm. And we, we, we talk with them and say, yeah, have no concerns about your um, skill set. What we're looking at is how we can work within our organization. Exactly. And that's really, that's really important. Exactly. So two half an hour interviews to get down to the, to the nitty gritty. Do you have... Arellis, are those document in the documents that we have? Do you follow that pretty much, or is there more art to it than that? I think for the most, I think for the most part, everything is followed according to how we have it written in the document. Because you know, as we're creating the document, we discuss, um, we discuss how we would perceive in the process. So for the most part, we try to stick very closely. To, uh, we have what we have in the document, yeah. Okay. And, and um, huh. imagine, you'll see that some of those questions can be really, really long. We, I think I gave you maybe three or four different kind of question sheets, and, and really what you want to look at is what will work for you in terms of uh, 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 getting, getting to your needs and then addressing the one and the needs and wants of that, of that uh, potential volunteer. Because if that, that's where you want the alignment to be. Your your values as an organization should connect with their values as an individual or as a professional, and then they want to bring that to your organization. And that's how you keep your long-term commitment. Okay. So in the first 90-day period, before the first evaluation, do you have them do serious work, or this is already at the minimum five-hour level per week? Arellis, go ahead. Oh, they, they have to come in. They have to come in ready to hit the ground running. Once we said, once we confirm that they're with the organization, and we're giving them all the information that they need regarding their team and their project, they're expected to hit the ground running. Okay. And, okay. Um, and at the end of that 90 day period is when we go, we, we review that process. But yes, they have to come in ready to hit the ground running. Basically. Okay, so this assumes there's a team that you put them on and that there's some management going on at some level within that team. So they're not, they're, they have structure. They're not put into, okay, do this task and they go off on their, on their own. It's not like that. They have a team that they report to or work with according to standard operating no. procedures? or No, we assign them to a team. And then um, we, there's, there's a memo that goes out that introduces them okay. to, to the project manager or the team lead. And then keep in mind that at this point, they have already interviewed with the project manager or the team leader both. And okay. um, they are then um, informed of the team meeting that, that, that takes place every week 
where they become aware of, um, you know, what's going on with the different projects. Okay. And at the same time, we also let them know that uh, on a weekly basis during these meetings, everyone basically updates each other on the progress of their project. Okay. And, 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 and at the same time, um, they know that they're able to email anyone on their team at any time, regardless of if they have any questions. Specifically, you know, either the project manager or the team lead. So there shouldn't be any reason for them to feel lost. And if they do, all they have to do is that they just get speaking up the phone and sending an email saying, can you guys help me with X, X Y, and Z? And the team member is and should be more than happy to help with any mm -hmm. uh, issues or that they may have. What did so you Mark find? Marcy, Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. Every uh, every team has a um, position description for the work that they do. So when when we actually put the um, um, when we when we request a position, the the team lead or the PM actually fills out documentation. Saying, this is specifically what I'm looking for, so that HR can post that ad, so that the individual knows that what they're getting into is what they actually applied for. Mm -hmm. That is that they have. A contact with their team who helps them, who walks them through the process. HR also does a two-week follow-up to, to make sure that they are engaged with their people, that they've been contacted, and, and we are, we serve as kind of a driving force um, to make sure that the uh, teams are staying engaged with their volunteers. So that's one of the roles that we serve. Okay. Um, in the document, there was one PowerPoint document that you sent that showed the whole Inter the onboarding process. Let me pull that right. up here as downloads. Um, this is the docs for March in here. So there was the one new hire procedures PPT. That's pretty accurate for what you do right now. So let's just go through it. So, so I heard, so the first 30 minute interview is with HR. The second one is actually with the project manager. Is that correct? Uh, your your voice and image froze for a minute, so we didn't get that. Ah uh, yes, um, I was asking if the first interview that's with HR, the volunteer manager, right. which is Aurelis, and then the second one is with who is it? With the project manager? It it can be. Um, sometimes we do two interviews with eight within HR, and and sometimes based on the skill level or the type of individual. It may happen with an HR team member um, and then two different team leads. Um, so the, uh, we, we try we try to manage that so they don't have too many interviews. But sometimes um, the science the scientist need is different than what um, uh, a, a scientist. So we we have people who may be an MD, PhD, whatever, uh -huh. and the need for that skill set with multiple teams. Uh -huh. So we teams come together to say, hey, who could this person best meet with? And sometimes they meet with, with two different teams. Okay. Uh, because they really, they really want them. But there's always an interview, at least one interview with human resources. Okay. So at least one interview, uh, one or more after that. And let's see if I look at the PowerPoint document. So, so let's just go through the new hire procedure. So status, uh, once a person need is identified, contact HR to begin a candidate search. Okay, let's take that. How does the candidate search occur? Is that, tell me more about your HR function as far as who does that and how it happens. Because to us, that's absolutely critical. We call that, um, it's really subject matter expert recruiting, we call that here. Uh, but what process do you have in place for that? So, uh, go ahead. You ready to go ahead, Arella? You want to do it? Do you want me to do it? Go ahead. I'll piggyback on. Okay. So, um, the, so we have a um, a staff member who's uh, our, our team whose specific role is to do the that. that's our director of talent acquisition. So okay. the the um, the team who has a need will submit a an app well, an application or a document that says here's here's the title, here's the role, here's the 
knowledge, skills, and abilities, and then we take that, we review it, and then we post it. Once that's posted, um, we look at the skills of the folks who have applied, and we, um, um, uh, I was going to use say weed out, but you know I can find a better phrase for that. We select out those individuals who meet the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, and then we have a core group of uh, candidates who meet their needs, and then we, we, we review those individuals, and we, and we often do it in two ways. Once we, once we do their physical, um, once, we, once we do their review of their background and their, their resume or their CV, uh -huh. we often will send that to the team and say, hey, we found three individuals who seem to meet your needs. Will they work for you? And then they will review it. And we almost always do this for the science, for some of the scientists, because their eye is really good. And they have sent back to us saying, this person is a medical doctor. They are a this, that, and the other but they don't have any, any experience in reviewing genetic material, right? They may, uh -huh. they may be really great, but then that, that team will review their CV and send it back and say, you know what, this person won't work for our team, but they may, and, and, and here's what they do, they may be really good for this other team. Okay. They know that, that the, the international team has a need for X, and this person has that skill in back. Okay. So once that happens, then we set up the interviews. And, and there's some documentation that you have there about how we contact individuals and we say, hey, we, you've reviewed everything. Please, please look at our website, our videos, all these other things. And then and literally, if you're still interested, um, we can set up an interview. And we do have people who decide, well, that's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to continue. And that, that's actually good for us because that's Definitely. one person. They, they self-selected. Right. Um, after that, we um, we have our uh, phone interviews um, uh, with HR and other departments, and then we start our onboarding process, which is, um, okay. I would say, relatively significant. Okay. It, but, yeah. Um, okay, so that's the talent recruit. Um, yeah, the talent acquisition. Director of talent acquisition. Before. S sorry, before we go further, can you tell me the the overall structure of your HR team? Um, we have a fantastic team of dedicated individuals, and we we have uh, so my role as the as the VP is um, uh, kind of oversight and direction. Um, uh, Arellis's role as the director of volunteer management is to wow, and, and she does so many things, but it is to engage. The volunteers across the board to uh, to ensure their success once they're onboarded. Uh, our director of talent acquisition um, takes information from our teams to do the searches for our individuals, and then starts the onboarding. And then our manager of volunteer engagement and that team should should be involved in um, development and interactions of the volunteers, so that we we have um, ideas, uh, training ideas, and um, tools that we want to provide for our volunteers so that they recognize it when we talk about caring for them that we do. So there are things that we want to put in place like resume reviews or um, communication enhancement skills or um, looking at their skills so that they can do training sessions for other people within the organization. Anything else you want to add to that, Arellis? Because we, we have a great structure. Uh, I yeah, heard... I Go ahead. So I, I heard Director of Volunteer Management, VP of HR, Director of Talent Acquisition, so that's three, and then Manager of Volunteer Engagement. Is that four people? Or Well, we have four, five, we have seven currently. So, so typically, um, um, we have each team, well, the Director of Talent Acquisition and the Director of Volunteer Management should have two additional people who work for them that they supervise. Um, Arellis, I think you just have one currently, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Are all those, so, um, uh, are all those role descriptions included in a, in a support packet that you sent? In a job description? Volunteer management and volunteer engagement, you have all, you have all their position descriptions as well. Okay. And if there's anything you see that you don't have, we can get it to you. Okay. 
but but they do they do uh, a relative and others do so much. They do the follow up for all the volunteers. They communicate across uh, divisions with all of the emails for any volunteer for the onboarding for the communication for the volunteer the follow up for the team leads and the PMs and the directors to say this person here here's the, where they are in the process here's when they've been onboarded here's when you need to send your letter to welcome them to the team as well as follow up um, they do a communication with the volunteers about who, where they are in the process we address issues for volunteers. Our volunteer candidates have said, you know, I, uh, where am I in the process? I haven't heard back from folks. Um, uh, and they address volunteers who believe that they have the skill set but weren't selected. Um, and they are in constant communication across the board to ensure that people are um, heard, connected, and engaged. And, and the only way that you can do that is by emailing them or having phone calls with them to let them know where they are in the process. And they do that um, a lot. So there are, there, are, there are a lot of emails between members of the HR team, the general public, volunteers, and team leads. Okay. And then a chicken and egg, egg argument when we before we have a, an HR team, what do you suggest? How do you see that process rolling out? Or maybe t share how it has rolled out for Rare Genomics. So I guess Jimmy started the HR team. What? How did that happen? Well, Morellis and I can both talk about this. Uh, Jimmy posted an ad, uh, several ads for different positions. After they had a um, retreat, where um, the board of directors and others said, if you want your organization to be successful, you need to focus on your human resources. Your volunteers are the reason that your organization is successful. Um, and Jimmy was doing all of the interviews. He was, he was calling folks, he was sending out emails, he was setting these things up, and he was, he was, he was interviewing people, uh -huh. which, which just was not, um, uh, what's the word, Arellis? It wasn't uh, efficient. Effective. It wasn't efficient. It wasn't a good use of his time. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was trying to do it all, and you can't do it all. Right. Right. So, so I think Arellis started before me. Um, okay. Because he really needed um, uh, competent, efficient folks to establish processes. So he, they did. They had an HR team um, who, and they had some processes in place. But what they needed for folks like the relatives and others was uh, um, not just leadership, but I'm going to use the word um, um, execution. Yeah. Execution where organizations just lack and they and they die because they they have all these great ideas but you can't put things into place so you need really competent people with experience to do the work and execution is not it's not task completion it is understanding how the organization works so that you can give people what they need and what they want and what what they were really engaged in early on was just task completion let's hire somebody uh -huh. Post an ad, but but that's not what that's not what's necessary. What's necessary is understanding why you need a position, what you really want it to do, and how you get the right people and how you keep them. So, um, a, a relist maintains a set of uh, Excel files, or or what are they? What are they? Sheets in Google? What are they called in Google? Well, well, uh, you mean the operating dashboard? Yeah, sheet sheet. Please talk about that. Yeah, we have an onboarding dashboard um, for ourselves primarily so, so that we're able to keep track of where the, app, the new volunteers are in the process. You know, if we just send them the, the uh, email requesting their HR information um, and what document we specifically need to receive from them before we can move forward. And also that way, for example, uh, Russell's wondering what happened is with new volunteer X, what's going on with him? If he's not able to get a hold of me, he can simply access that document and see, oh, okay, it looks like we're waiting for this person to send in their document. Or, okay, we're about to send this person the welcome letter. So it's important for everyone in the team to know where each volunteer is in the process. What's also important is 
the thing about um, the volunteer, uh, how excited about they are about getting in, in, into the organization, how excited about they are about starting to um, volunteer. We want we want to be able to uh, let them know that okay, you, you know, you as soon as we receive this paperwork from you, you receive information regarding your new assignment in your team. You be introduced to your new team. You get information regarding your weekly meeting, so that they know that um, we are working behind the scenes to get them on board. Okay. Marcia, the, the infrastructure that is necessary so that you do not have to wonder what's going on is mm -hmm. so important. Yeah. So there, there are levels of documents um, from, the, from the start of the organization that has uh, individual position, hire dates, all these things, um, uh, offboarding dates, all of this information is so critical. And in addition to that, as a, as a nonprofit, you're going to need to maintain your volunteer hours, not not as employees, because um, um, there, there are some issues around that. But uh, as you need to you need to keep a record of hours so that you can actually submit that to the IRS and say, here's how many hours our volunteers are providing, um, and it's all volunteer hours, and you and you will be able to use that information um, uh, as you get corporate sponsors and others because they will ask for you, they will ask you to tell them detailed information about your volunteer community. What are their what are what are their background? What now we do not collect any um, uh, racial, ethnic or gender data on any of our volunteers. Because we don't need we don't fill out the EEO one C EEOC one documentation because they're not employees. Um, but some organizations, some companies want to know: um, Are you a, a majority woman-owned organization? Do you, you know, what's your, what is your population, and who do you serve? So mm -hmm. we maintain pretty significant data on our volunteers, but we don't we, we do not have gender, race, or ethnicity as part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have all of their CDs and resumes and uh, interview questions and all that as part of as part of their um, okay. Record their put their onboard okay. record. So okay, so we covered the structure of the HR team with the four people with two two supporting two supporters for two other positions there. We've got the role description for each. What about more of the standard operating procedures for each position? Is that documented, like Aurelis or, or Russell, or is that art? No. I Something that we need to have in place um, so that you can continuously follow the same process. Obviously, um, you need to make ongoing changes. For example, you know, if, you add, if you happen to have a new position, have a new job description, any specific new procedure that we decide to add. So we're we're always. I feel like we're always updating. Um, this, uh, this SLP just to kind of keep track of, you know, if there's like an issue that we haven't dealt with before mm -hmm. or um, okay. because of the organization that we have to continuously uh, keep on updating. Uh, absolutely. So, so we, we have SLPs for all positions and for, and for processes. So we have standard operating procedures across the board for the organization. And when, and when we, uh -huh. and when we, when, an, when a team asks us questions about process or structure, we'll ask them for their standard operating procedure process so that we can put that into the documentation folders so that they actually know that they have a process in place. And sometimes they're even surprised that they have them. Okay, now, so you did not you did not send this in the um, in docs, right? No. Um, I, I'll put some notes down for some things that, you, that may be helpful. So... Because the standard operating procedures um, is often specific to a team or a team structure. So Certainly. I'll send you an SOP example. Right. Because um, what I'm seeing is uh, uh, a good start for us 
would be to take study what you have adapt those documents I mean it's a lot of this is more or less standard the thing that impresses me is uh, about the way you do it is one is the seriousness because absolutely that's that's one of the key learnings you can't treat it like oh I'm just a volunteer there's a responsibility that is great it appears you're top grading your candidates you've got a pretty rigorous process for acceptance and culture fit and by the way how many people do you accept for when you have an, a job announcement how many do you go through to hire one position typically well, that's a great question um, we, we typically review four resumes for four per position and okay. based on based on the time that it takes to uh, connect and get their information um, Aramis, I'd say our take rate, our take rate is probably fifty percent, and 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 part of that is because um, people don't. Uh, we ask for uh, 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 references, and sometimes folks don't provide them. And when they don't provide them, you'll you'll see one of the one of the thank you but no thanks letters, one of the one of the <laughs> yeah. accepted letters. It's because they didn't provide their references. And, and, and sometimes they will contact us and say, hey, I've been in the business a long time. Why do I need to give you references? Well, be, because we actually inter we, we talk with the references. We review their data and say, they, they say this person is great or this person is not. And the thing is, I, uh, uh, there's often confusion around references. I continue to tell people, don't just ask someone for a reference. Ask someone if they can provide you a good reference. There is a distinction between the two, and some folks don't always recognize that. They just they'll say, "Oh, talk to my professor or my colleague," and the colleague will say, "I would never work with them if they're last person on earth." And so sometimes I'm I'm happy that we got the information, but the other thing is, do they not know um, that they need to find people who will say positive things about their work performance? Uh, but I mean, if if the negative does come. Do you look at it as positive or negative? That sounds like a positive because you avoided potential conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I'm happy to get that. I sometimes wonder if the individual knows how they're perceived. And perhaps, I mean, that's one of the 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 requirements. It's like people have to be aware enough or take it seriously enough that they pay attention to right. that. So it could be right. a good. Right. Right. Yeah. We, uh, Arellis, I know you. I, well, there have been follow up conversations structure around um, we didn't get the references and that that's one of the things when we look at the onboarding dashboard we can see where this person is in the process and we, we got one of two references or one of three references and we will send out follow-up letters we will contact them we will add additional references and sometimes it just don't provide them and that and that and that causes us to not bring that onboard that person mm-hmm yeah okay so Okay, so we covered candidate search. Now, do you have any suggestions like um, the person who does your candidate search, they are, I mean, they're pretty, they're top notch, that they, they've been selected, so they, they're effective at this. I mean, they're the kind of people that could teach us how to do that, right? I mean, so. Absolutely. Right. So, assuming we find that person for candidate search, do you have any suggestions on? I mean, for us, it's about identifying smartly the various subject matter experts that we need. Sometimes it's um, what I would call hard to find. Like for me, for example, okay, we want to, so we're building open source houses. We actually want to burn limestone to make local concrete uh, from lime. Okay, well, how do I even know where to begin on finding that person? So um, is that what I'm bringing on the H, the basically the talent search person on for, they're going to be good at that, right? Or, or how do I know that person is going to have the, the technical experience required to do well at that job? Because for us, it's going to be pretty, pretty technical a lot of times. Um, how do I, I know, because I mean, I, I know that I'm stuck at sometimes on how to find somebody, but I'm better than an average person. Um, any suggestions on how do we know this person is going to be effective or it's just basically it's like you try if they don't work you you try to you keep trying until you find the right person right I mean probably expecting to to go through some people before you get your dream team Arella, you want to start? 
Yeah, we're going to write a job description with mm -hmm. which will note the skills and qualifications that you're looking for. Yeah. And um, that's the best way to start. Right, right. And we're expecting that the applicant to that position should have most, if not all, of the the skills listed on there. That's that's a good way to start. Right. And yes, obviously, you may find someone who um, may have all the skills, but not may, may not necessarily be a great people person, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, sometimes it's trial and error, and um, but that's the best way to start. And you're obviously going to do your research regarding the best websites. Um, to post your positions, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've idealist.org. Idealist.org? Yep. Yeah. Yes, idealist. Yep. Yep. Have you heard of them? Yes, I've heard of them, yep. But maybe maybe, maybe you can talk to us about what are the top uh, venues. Like, um, I don't... Okay, maybe you can... Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. So maybe you can discuss briefly what are the top, some of the top places where we can look for as far as volunteers go. I, um, I'm having an issue with the song. I can't hear you. But idealist.org uh -huh. um, has, it's one of the best websites for um, posting nonprofit job description. They also have some great programs. Um, for example, your, to address your question, they have, they have a lot of great programs that they may be able to help you with. Okay. So, so Idealist is good. Uh, volunteer Match is great. Um, and LinkedIn. I'm trying LinkedIn. to work on this, this, um, the volume issue that I have, I'm having here. Okay. What did you say? Arellis? She said she's got a volume issue. Okay. Um, um, so volunteer match is good. LinkedIn is really good. LinkedIn has two. LinkedIn has two interesting areas. They have their their, their standard third um, uh, kind of full time W two position uh, opportunity, and then they also have a volunteer website. Now the interesting thing about um, LinkedIn is you do not need to buy advertising for your you post as an individual or as an organization. You post your job, and you just as a kind of an announcement. Okay. So, and and that um, they uh, LinkedIn wants you to pay for um, um, advertising, but you you can in many ways you can you can get around that if you talk with them about being a volunteer organization. They will they will provide you with some um, potentially with some free. Uh, job postings, but once you, but as an organization, you kind of make an announcement that you have uh, okay. a position open, and you describe what that position is, and you okay. always volunteer. Okay. You will because you will get an engineer who says that it sounds great, um, and and just to pay. So you just want to ensure that um, it, you know it's a volunteer position. No, it's a volunteer position. Yes. Okay, so, um, so assuming we have, um, okay, so for te a technical talent recruiter, any would these places be pretty good for that, or do you? Well, you saw, yeah, whatever is, is, um, are out there. Like we we use a, a, a site called Genome Web, where um, researchers and um, uh, genomic uh, and xenomic um, uh, scientists are, and so they'll look at our, they'll they'll go to that location and they'll um, say, hey, I, I want to volunteer, and okay. it pushes into the volunteer match. So if you if there are engineering sites or architectural sites, um, including school forms or school forms, it's important to use those. And and so so I think what one of the things that's going to be really important for you is to hire your your team. Your, your HR team and look for that individual who will meet, meet two or three needs. And the needs that I think that you have are, how can you find, if you want someone who you can, uh, who you can 
trust. And trust comes from being trustworthy, right? So you want somebody that you feel that you can connect with. Um, and that's going to be vitally important for you and for your senior staff. And then you want that person to be able to find the technical individual, wherever that may be, a technical uh, recruiter who knows how to go after people, but who isn't so focused on, um, I'm going to call it value recruiting, because that's not what you're doing. No, no, it's what high cultural fit. At, right. Exactly. And, and so that's what you need to have with that person. It's not just about finding bodies. Exactly. Yeah. Someone who has significant talent experience, um, you want about their recruiting style. Because um, uh, often what happens is recruiters specifically look at keyword, they just do keyword searches um, about the technical skills. But you are looking for something that's far, um, that, that's more, I, I would say that is more important, just as important as that. They are lifestyle and investors. For clarity, I mean, we are all lifestyle investors, so it's right. yeah, it begins with that. Mm -hmm. And you will, you will hear, you will literally hear in the voices of the candidates that you talk with how um, enamored or engaged or interested they are with how you describe your organization. Yeah, um, and, and I, I think what you all have created is really fantastic. So when you hear people use that language back at you. This is fantastic. I would love to participate. Those are things that are important. Um, but we, we do not get lulled by the uh, yeah. that desire statement. We, we want to know how they would demonstrate it. And, exactly. And that, that's really the question that we ask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think... Uh, yeah, this is great stuff. I mean, we're I've got too many more questions. This would take another three hours so so I think we're gonna have to quit pretty soon here but okay but maybe um where are the best places to go from from here because I definitely want to continue yeah yeah um you know maybe we can continue this uh, I've definitely got many more questions here because we want to probably what would you suggest would be the a good place to start I mean would I want to go through I think it's about defining the so, so you send a bunch of documents. So, so pr there's protocols on one side. How would you suggest approaching the chicken and egg argument where you don't have the we don't have the the team yet, nor do we have standardized procedures for the teams themselves? I think it appears that before we go anywhere in recruiting, we need to stabilize some of the tasks and put good definition on those. Before exactly. we, so there's, do you? There's, there's, would that be the first? One. Okay. Yes. It would be the first thing. You want to define your mission. Okay. Define your mission as an organization, um, and then build everything around that. So your, for whatever teams you you believe that you need, whatever teams that you want, you, you will start a a framework, and that, that's all you really need. You want the framework for each. Team. Um, whether it's and, and what teams you think you need. Uh, for right. example, CAD design, machine design. I mean, design team, design team, CAD team. Right. So um, that, that, that's perfect. So your the design team, you um, you could always find the specifics, and, and it's it's KSA, the knowledge, skills, and abilities. You could always find the KSA for a designer or a CAD developer, right? Um, so you, you but what you want to be able to put in your heading part of the mission they will do X Y Z and so um, you, you you have your organizational mission you have your team uh, uh, ideology or vision and then you build around that so you you will hire people who are visionary um, and who are technically sound and you decide which more do you want that? Do you want folks to be more technically sound, or do you want folks to be more visionary? Because remember, you can you can almost always teach a certain skill. There are certain skills that can take longer to learn, but you can teach skill. But what you want are those folks who have have um, a drive and a desire. I I would say that you 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 want to be careful around people who are only passionate 
passionate. Definitely. Passion burns out. Passion right. burns out when, when projects don't work. Passion burns out when they don't have the team that they like. Passion burns out in a lot of ways because it's a, it's an emotion. You, you want to have a balance of passion and drive with a balance of technical skill because the technical skill piece can help someone, can carry someone through when the times get kind of rough and things are boring or there are um, a, a values clashes. So, mm-hmm. I, so I would say this. Start with values. What's, what are your values as an organization? Uh, work on mission, and then set up the structure for each team. And we and, and I and I'd be happy, or some of our team members would be happy to work with you on that as well. So start with values, mission, and then structure of the team. Right, because if you are able to say, here's what our values are. We are about X, Y, and Z. People look at that and say, oh yeah, that connects with my values. And then when they look at your mission and your mission says, we, this organization does this for this reason and for that. And the mission is also relatively short. They say, oh, I can, I can connect with that mission. That sounds like something I'm really interested in doing, giving back to the community, using my resources for environment or whatever it might be. Those folks are the ones who would say, oh, yeah, I connect with their vision, I connect with their values, and I like their mission. And so that, that's how you, that's the initial draw or the initial hook that brings folks through the door. They say, man, I didn't even know that that existed. I would love to, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. build something like that. I would love to do something like right. that. Right. And then you have that. And then you say, hey, what skills do you have? They say, I'm an engineer. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a designer. I'm this, I'm that. And then that's how you get those folks who have that, that skill set and that and that desire. Mm-hmm. So structure of the team with this with the structure of the team naturally comes the standard procedures for that team what's the protocol for how do we do for example design right so that has right. to be de- defined and and tasks have to be defined right i mean so that once they get going there's a structure enough that hr brings in people and that team can go on so okay right. so values mission structure of team and that comes from so I would do that and then recruit an HR, the the VP of HR around that? Or So the first person I recruit for the team is who? Like the VP of HR slash um, talent seeker? Like, I mean, well, who, do you, who do you have with you currently? Jonathan, who's on the call right now, is the closest to what we have as a community manager. We vet uh-huh. people and things like that a little bit. But I mean, we don't have anywhere of a formal structure uh, with everything defined so so Jonathan could help we we talk about this all the time so now but now we got to get serious about some structure where this stuff starts going beyond us right so right. no we don't we're not far I mean it's ad hoc right. I mean a lot of this is so ad hoc mm-hmm right 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 um, uh, here I would say two things first don't get stuck on titles um, mm-hmm. people, uh, because you, you, you may get people who are only interested in the title a vice VP or director, um, um, the titles. So so don't don't allow folks to get stuff on titles either. Right. Like, you can give a, you, somebody can be a director, they can be a manager, whatever. But the the func- their function, their functional role is to support the success of the organization. Um, the functional role of human resources is to support the success of the organization, the larger success of the organization. And we will do that in whatever ways um, are relevant to our task. Okay? And mm-hmm. every and every piece of your organization, so think about that. Yeah. My role is to support the success of the organization. Now, how do I do that? Or can I do it by great design? Or I do it by this? Whatever it is. Right. And, and, that, that, and that is your role. Um, is to ensure that people understand that you're serious about that, about right. um, supporting the success of your organization for whatever they're doing, and that and that and that means that they cannot um, be a silo right. in their organization. Exactly. I can only do X. I can only do these three things because that's not my job. Other things aren't my job. And, and you'll you'll be able to talk with those folks and, and understand that and we we folks out uh, off right off the bat. You you will you will have interviews with folks who you would consider your core staff members who will be supporting the organization and you and you'll do this. They will ask you, Hey, is there a stipend for me? 
because I love to work, but, you know, literally, my mother told me, if, even if you're volunteering, you got to get some money. And you say, oh, you know, that's not what we're about. And that person is gone, okay? And that is great because that's one less thing you have to worry about. Right. But make a decision about the, the types of people you need yeah. next to you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then build from there. And, yep. if, and if you can get a couple of people who um, who can support you, then I need you to let that process go. You can oversee it, but but turn it over to them fully, so that there are other things that you can work on. Absolutely. So Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy used to come to all of the uh, HR meetings, and then and then he said, I and, and then he said this. Well, I trust that they know what they're doing, and then he left us alone. Well. Mm-hmm. But that's that, good. But that, but that trust comes at the point where you demonstrate that you can do the task, right? And so what, yeah. what you need to think about are what what would determine for you that you can trust this person? Is it is it that you see their agendas? Is that you see their processes completing? Is that they meet mm. the time frame? As long as you have those things either in your head or written out, then it can make your job a lot easier. And then and then you can give them the task. And, and you can and you can specifically say, hey, and I'm going to follow up every week, or I'm going to follow up every two weeks just to see where you're where you're at. But okay. um, get your get your right hand and left hand people together, and then turn the task over to them with your um, with, with your vision connected with it. Once you're able to do that, um, you can. Uh, it, it's very. It, 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 it will start to move on its own. Yeah, and that'll be a great day for the organization here, which has not happened. Right. As a high innovation organization, but I think we got what we got to do is we got to stabilize some things. Of course, we innovate like crazy on some things, but we got to stabilize some that we can start getting people in because that's that's the perennial problem. We're going too fast, and things are yeah. changing too fast. Right. So, right. 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 yeah. So 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 put put your put your executive team together so that you can um, define the outcomes that you're looking for for the organization, and then break those tasks up. So that those individuals can do it. There's a the, the phrase that people used to use is you know cut the salami. That salami looks really big, but when you slice <laughs> it up in, in small slices, you, you can you can eat it better, right? Right. And, and it looks like it's not so huge um, and, mis- and and unmanageable. So right. so I I think the world of Jimmy, and I think he's he's fantastic. And what one of the things that he has done is he's allowed me and others to manage their team. So that we can effectively support the organization, and yeah. and what I was able to do was look at Arellis's skill and a couple of other staff members and say, man, they are really good. Not only should they be promoted, but they should be, um, and you know, and pr- the promotion is entitled because they're doing the same work without pay. Mm-hmm. But it's it's how can I support them so I don't lose them? And so what I want to do is make sure that Arellis has people to support her so that she doesn't have to do all the work, all the tasks. And mm-hmm. once you are able to do that, people will see that you, not, not, not only that you care about them, but that you have a far-reaching direction so that they will have a long, so they will be long-term participants within the organization. Right. And, and, that, and that, that issue is don't burn out your volunteers and, and don't burn yourself out by trying to do too much. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. No. That's that's good. So what I would suggest is maybe we start drawing up some of the the critical documents to start putting the infrastructure into place. So maybe yeah. probably the best would be so I've got your documents and maybe I can pass on some of what we're starting to generate myself and Jonathan regarding what to start and get the structure and I guess the so so create some documents and then look for that person to be the first person that's going to take multiple roles on at once then see how we yeah. expand from there it might be yeah. that might be Jonathan himself Jonathan do you have um, any comments are you available to talk there or yeah absolutely yeah I mean this is really uh, really not only informative but definitely there's some substance in terms of where the rubber meets the road and being able to not only have you know recruits coming in but uh, looking at the, the loyalty and, and re- retaining retention and that's one of the things that we, you know, have definitely been wanting to establish, you know, as a volunteer organization. So I think it's pretty phenomenal that you guys are functioning in an organizational volunteer capacity. 
uh, and definitely formalizing a HR team and a recruitment team. And so moving forward, I think this is definitely going to help to be able to spread the workload. So like you said, to prevent burnout as well as amongst other things. Uh, I think there's mm-hmm. just an evolution and I think job descriptions and title descriptions are very critical for finding the right kinds of, uh, you know, like you said, the KSAs. People have the competency, but they also not only have the passion, but they also got to be able to have the drive to press through with the technical ability. So we've seen a lot of those cycles, people coming and going, and uh, ideally it's a matter of articulating exactly what we're doing, I guess, on an annual basis and, and keeping a pipeline of talent when we are actually developing technology to a point that, because uh, one of the challenges we have is, is the distributive enterprise and to be right. a self, self-sustaining volunteer organization where there is the, the, the assumption as well as even the expectation to to fund R&D and also be an entrepreneur uh, to, to have distributive business and enterprise. So there's a lot of unique challenges that we have that we're going to have to adapt, uh, but I think your organization is probably the closest that we've probably come to. So that is very a positive thing, and it definitely gives me some some relief to know that, that there's some good content that you guys are delivering. So, uh, uh, you know, again, thank you for sharing, and it's definitely very informative and helpful. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yep. Let me, let me just say this, and then, and then I'm, I'm done. Yep. Do you, do you all, unless you have a question, do, do you know... Um, you don't need to answer this now, but do you know where you want to be in a, in a year and where you want to be in five years? No. And <laughs> not, not exactly. We've got a 20-year roadmap, um, yeah, which we could say. gladly <laughs> share. But there are, I mean, there are some technical, on the technical front, it's kind of mapped out for the general milestones. But we haven't really defined clear milestones for, okay, on HR, this is where we want to be. And I think we have to do that at this point. Uh, just get get more specific what do we want because um i think with us it's like be careful what you i, I really do believe be careful what you ask for because you're going to get it and, and i think that's the case because we do have good good social capital so we can make happen we just have to decide what we want to make happen with this and and i know like for me um getting to some of the recent developments it's really about hey this is not scaling like it needs to without stopping here a little bit on the hr and other essential substance on the organizational front so but we're going to have to define that for the one in five years. Um, right. I have a coach who said, okay, do your three-year vivid vision. He says three because uh, one year is too short. Three is right. not five. Um, five is like too far, but three is very tangible. So, um, But the next, I mean, just to share that the next milestone is, I mean, people who are actually gaining livelihoods from this work by some of the products that are actually viable products. Whether the 3D printer, the brick press, the house, the actual house building model that we do. But those, I mean, a lot of things that we do are pretty complex. So our goal was to train people as deep immersion training students for our work. Um, so that's, but we're, we've got many gaps in the organization. So we got to clarify and yeah. go forward. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, well, um, uh, I, I don't know if you have my number. Um, but you have my contact information. I'd yeah. be happy to talk to you guys at any at any point along the way. And um, yeah, uh, I think it's great. Arella, do you have any? Do you have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if your volume issues are corrected, but do you have anything? Fine, I think I'm fine. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Mark, I will I will give you some standard operation procedures. And then um, I'll send you an email with uh, just a couple of the websites that we use, LinkedIn, Volunteers, Idealist, and anything else that we can use. Yeah, excellent, excellent. We'll just copy what you do because you do it well, and we'll, we'll start from there. So, so thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> if, you if you don't have to reinvent the wheel, don't. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's how we work. So, yeah, we'll start with that and definitely look forward to more feedback from you guys to help us guide the process. Okay. Okay. Okay, Russell and Rels. Well, thank you so much, and we'll close the, close it here. We'll be in touch. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you, Rels. Bye bye.